Imagine we have a point here, and it moves around in the space where it lives. We can trace its path by simply painting where it's been. This will create a curve. Since in this case the curve lies on the plane of your screen, we can assign a coordinate system with the origin wherever we want, and then parameterize the curve. This parameter t plays a very similar role to time, but not necessarily. It is useful though to think about it as the input and the vector given by the coordinates of the point as the output. So for every input of time, there is an output of position. This will allow us to not only draw the curve formed by the path, but also to do calculus on it. We could calculate limits, derivatives, the integrals, and so on. But all of this is possible only because this curve, which we'll call gamma, takes inputs in R and returns outputs in R2. In other words, gamma is a mapping from the Euclidean flat space R, which is the real line, to the Euclidean flat space or surface R2. But what if we tell you that actually, actually, all of it is happening on a curved surface, and that we just thought it was flat because we were too close to perceive the curvature of the space around us? Well, if this is true, then our situation really sucks because of all the calculus we just did. Namely, limits, derivatives, integrals, etc. are just wrong. We cannot do calculus anymore because now we found out that actually gamma is a mapping from the Euclidean or flat space R to the non-Euclidean, so not flat curved space M. We usually call this space M because it is a manifold. If you want to know in detail, in a very intuitive way, what a manifold is, watch this video right here. After finishing this one, of course. And we'll link it in the description as well. But just to say it quickly and not very rigorously, a manifold is a space in one, two, three, or even n dimensions that can have or not have curvature. But most importantly, that looks like a Euclidean flat space locally. A very good example is the Earth, and the fact that we cannot perceive the curvature of the Earth just by standing on it. Locally, it looks flat, so we say that the Earth is locally a Euclidean space, or simply a manifold. Don't ask a flat earther, though. They don't know the difference between a Euclidean space and a manifold. Anyway, now we have a very peculiar situation. The curve gamma that describes the path we are interested in lives in the manifold M. And what is really tricky is to visually understand the fact that M does not live inside of any other space. Of course, it is really hard to represent it on a screen, but all you need here is to convince yourself of the fact that M is a space of its own, such that it does not need another larger space where to live in in order to exist. In mathematical terms, we say that M is not embedded in higher dimensional space. If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. So, how do we fix the problem? I mean, we still want to be able to do calculus on the manifold. And that's where differential geometry comes in. This subject gives us all the necessary tools to achieve our goal. So now that we understand the situation from the intuitive point of view, and that we clearly stated the problem we're trying to solve, let's level up the discussion. Picture an abstract manifold M with dimension N not embedded in a higher dimensional space like Rn. Then we pick a point P in it, in a small neighborhood U around the point P. We can define a parametrized curve passing through P, called gamma of T that goes from an interval AB in R to M. Its image in M is the interval gamma of A, gamma of B. Let's also impose that the entire curve is inside the neighborhood U. Next, we define a mapping phi from the neighborhood U in the manifold to Rn with image phi of u in Rn. N is the dimension of the manifold M, as well as the dimension of the Euclidean space Rn. Since we can create a composite mapping, phi composed with gamma, from the interval AB in the real line to Rn, we can also do calculus here. 
because this is a mapping from a one-dimensional Euclidean space to an n-dimensional Euclidean space. But what do we mean by do calculus? Well, we'll see it shortly. But first, some important remarks. The manifold M cannot be described using the traditional X, Y, and Z, so the Euclidean coordinates, because it's not necessarily embedded in Rn. So, we need to define instead intrinsic coordinates uv, which will serve as a sort of grid used to measure distances in m. Actually, in order to measure distances, a metric must be defined. And by the way, when applying this to general relativity, the metric is usually defined as g, and it describes gravity on the manifold. Another important remark is that the mapping phi from the neighborhood u and m to rn is called the local chart by mathematicians and coordinate system by physicists. Let's see a concrete example now. We have an abstract 2D manifold m, which is paraboloid shaped, but it's not embedded in R3. Pick a point p in m and let u be a small neighborhood of p. This neighborhood U allows us to work locally on M. We cannot use the traditional X, Y, Z coordinates of Euclidean space. Instead, we'll describe it using intrinsic coordinates U, V. Define gamma from 0, 10 in the real line to the manifold M as a parameterized curve on M. The domain 0, 10 in R serves as the interval of the parameter T. And the image of gamma is the curve on M. Let the curvature gamma of t, which is u of t and v of t, represent the path in terms of intrinsic coordinates u, v on m, where u of t is going to be defined as t and v of t, t squared. Here, u of t, v of t, represent the coordinates of the curve gamma in the intrinsic coordinate system u, v on m. But we still didn't talk about how these intrinsic coordinates u, v will look like globally on m. The intrinsic coordinates act like a grid on M. In our case, we picked our grid to represent directions and distances on M, similar to polar or geodesic coordinates that vary smoothly as we move across the surface. We're not going to go into detail here, but if you want to know more about how these intrinsic coordinates UV are defined, check out the last pages of the PDF in the description below. Let's talk about the local chart phi now. Define a mapping phi from u to r2, which flattens the neighborhood u in m into r2. Phi of uv is going to be defined as just uv. This is a very simple mapping that takes intrinsic coordinates uv and directly maps them in r2. Now we compose phi with gamma. Phi composed with gamma goes from 0, 10 in the real line to r2. And in this case, phi composed with gamma of t is going to be t, t squared, which is a parabola in R2. This is a composite mapping from a one-dimensional Euclidean space R to a 2D Euclidean space R2. And therefore, we can do calculus on it. The first one is differentiation. The derivative of phi composed with gamma is the derivative of its coordinates which results in the vector 1, 2, t. This is the tangent vector from t equals 0 to t equals 10. If t represents time, then this vector is the linear or tangent velocity at each point of gamma. Now, an important question is, where does the vector 1, 2, t live? One could say that this vector lives in the manifold M, but it doesn't make sense even from a visual point of view, because the manifold is curved and a vector is straight. Of course, assuming that we're using the simplistic view of a vector as an arrow. So the tangent vector would stick out of M, but this representation is nonsense as well, because we said that the manifold is not embedded into another higher dimensional space. So it doesn't make sense to draw anything outside of the manifold M. There is no outside world with respect to the manifold. So our representation here was actually wrong. At this point, one could say that the tangent vector 1, 2, t lives in the space R2, where phi lands. But this is also not completely true. The tangent vector actually lives in the tangent space of the point phi composed with gamma of t, which is actually another distinct copy of R2.
we notice that for t equals 0, 1, 0 is the tangent vector, or velocity vector, if you will, at the initial point gamma of 0 in the manifold m. And for t equals 10, 120 is the tangent vector at the initial point gamma of 10 in the manifold m. We can also see that this tangent vector increases linearly from the initial point to the final one along the curve gamma. Second, magnitude of the tangent vector and integration. The magnitude or Euclidean length of the tangent vector is this. So the square root of 1 plus 4t squared. In order to find the arc length of the curve in R2, from t equals 0 to t equals 10, we integrate the magnitude of the tangent vector over this interval. This integral represents the length of the path t t squared in R2 and can be evaluated as follows. We'll show the calculations really quickly here, but if you want to study them in detail, which we highly recommend you doing, check out the PDF link in the description, otherwise you can just skip to the final result. Let's perform a change of variables here, where t is going to be defined as a half hyperbolic sine of theta, and as a consequence, its derivative is going to be hyperbolic cosine of theta. This lets us write the integral this way. At this point, we can use the following trigonometric inequality. 1 is equal to the hyperbolic cosine of theta squared minus the hyperbolic sine of theta squared. So we can write this integral as this. And the next trigonometric identity we will use here is this one. The hyperbolic cosine of theta squared is 1 plus the hyperbolic cosine of 2 theta, all of it over 2. Using it in our current expression, we're going to get this. Going back to the definition of t as a half hyperbolic sine of theta, we can write theta in terms of t. We just performed the inverse. And from it, we have the following. In order to simplify the calculations, we'll use another trigonometric identity in the second term. The hyperbolic sine of 2 theta is 2 times the hyperbolic sine of theta times the hyperbolic cosine of theta. We can evaluate the first term and perform this substitution in the second term. Next, we notice that the hyperbolic sine of 0 is 0. We cancel out these 2's in the second term and we use once again the two facts that we have found In other words, the expression of theta in terms of t, and vice versa. After updating these results, we finally get this approximation. 101.05 And this is the approximate length of the path t t squared in R2. Third, curvature. To find the curvature kappa of the path t, t squared in r squared, we use this formula, where x is t and y is t squared. Let's calculate it. This curvature describes how sharply the curve t, t squared bends at each point in r squared. When t tends to 0, kappa of 0 is 2, which implies that the curvature is highest at the start. When t tends to infinity, kappa tends to 0, which implies that the curve flattens out as it moves farther from the origin. That's it for today, but check out the PDF link in the description. There you'll find a more detailed explanation of these concepts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I'm pretty sure you're gonna love this one. See you there.